Monday, February 20th. February 13th, 2023. Uh, this hearing of the Minnesota Senate Agriculture Broadband and Rural Development Committee is now in session. A quorum is present. Folks, got a nice theme for today. We're talking about bio stuff. And we have uh, an informational hearing that will uh, begin a, a little bit. And then we have two bills along that theme. Uh, so uh, our first uh, presentation will be about bioincentives and biofuels infrastructure programs. And this is from our friends at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. So if you could please come to the table, state your full name for the record, and commence your testimony. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. For the record, my name is Andrea Vobble. I serve as Deputy Commissioner for the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. And with me, I have Megan Lennon, uh, who is the supervisor of our Energy and Environment section with our Ag Marketing and Development Division. She is our for our most expert on biofuels and the bio and all things bio stuff. So um, I'm just gonna kick it over to her to, uh, to get it started. Thank you for the record. My name is Megan Lennon. Thank you Chair Putnam and members for inviting us to present today. I'm gonna give two um, high level overviews of programs that the agency administers. And the presentation is based on the two legislative reports that were submitted in January and um, were made available to the members. So the first program I'm going to talk about is the Bioincentive Program. Oops, let me see here. Um, this program was established by the legislature in 2015 with the purpose of promoting commercial scale production of renewable chemicals, advanced biofuels, and biomass thermal uh, heating for energy. And just really quickly, I'll give you some quick definitions to help frame the conversation today. So renewable chemicals are um, any polymer, um, plastic, any material, it could be composite material that is made entirely of biomass. And advanced biofuels are any biofuels that have a greater than 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions re, um, relative to uh, the petroleum fuel as a baseline. And then biomass thermal energy is the generation of energy for commercial or industrial heat and processing that uses cellulosic material that displaces a fossil fuel. There are eligibility criteria for these programs in statute. And once a facility is deemed eligible by MDA staff and officially enters the program, that facility is eligible for uh, payments for up to 10 years. And so this slide is just um, a primer on how the program works. So eligible producers receive a payment per unit of production. And for the advanced biofuels and the, um, the biomass thermal energy, that unit of production is a million British thermal unit, and you'll see later in the presentation I've noted that is MMBTU. And then for the renewable chemical, that unit of production is, is pounds of renewable chemical produced. Um, on the legislative report on page six, there's a summary table that contains information on the production type, unit, and compensation rates, and those compensation rates are set in statute. Um, this program does have a maximum production reimbursement per year uh, for each eligible producer, and there is a maximum total production reimbursement per year by production type. Facilities that are in this program must source 80% or more of the biomass used from Minnesota, and the biomass uh, is um, agricultural crops, trees, woody waste and residues, animal waste, and also the organic portion of solid wastes. And one thing I wanna note is that the statute does have standards in place for cellulosic biomass harvesting to make sure that the biomass that's used in this program is sourced in a way that protects our environment and our natural resources. And then the last piece about how this program works is when um, an eligible facility submits a claim for reimbursement, they need to supply information on the biomass source, the type, um, and then also they need to submit a certified public accountant attestation that um, addresses the production volume that they're claiming reimbursement for. 
Okay, so um, like I said before, production claims are submitted quarterly. And beginning in fiscal year 2019, that was the first year that claims outpaced the funding that was made available for the program. And the totals on the left-hand side are accurate through calendar year 2022, so they're cumulative for the program. So total claims made through the end of calendar year 2022 is about 23.8 million total paid 13.9 million and then total unpaid claims is 9.8 million. And then on the right hand side of the slide you'll see a table that just shows the amount appropriated for this program um, per biennium. So you can see at the beginning of the program starting in uh, fiscal year 2016 it started at half a million dollars and then has ramped up over time as this program became more popular and more facilities enter the program. Okay, so this last slide on the bioincentive program, I just want to talk, talk about the program success a little bit. This program is supported by a broad coalition of people throughout the state, and it's really an economic driver. This program helps drive economic development and is also a public policy tool that helps bring companies, projects, and investments to Minnesota. And the facilities that are participating in this, in this program are not only providing local jobs and spurring economic development, but they are offsetting fossil fuel usage by either creating a bio-based alternative or using biomass instead of um, fossil fuels or fuel heating oil or natu natural gas um, to heat their facility or run their processes. So right now we have 16 participating facilities in 2023. And on the right-hand side of the slide, I just have some cumulative outcomes. So since the program's inception, there's been 18.5 million gallons of advanced biofuels produced. And this is all cellulosic ethanol made from the fibers within the corn kernels. And there is 69.7 million pounds of renewable chemicals produced and at 174,600 million British thermal units of biomass thermal heating. And so just a quick note on that last bullet point, it's really hard for me to wrap my head around MMBTUs, so I did a quick calculation, and that's the energy equivalent in about 1.2 million gallons of number two fuel oil. Okay, so Mr. Chair, that is my quick overview of the bioincentive program. I'm happy to pause now for questions or I can continue on and talk about the biofuel infrastructure grant program. Thank you, Ms. Lennon. I think for the sake of efficiency, we might ask you to continue and then we'll hold members' questions until your presentation is complete. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, program number two, the biofuels infrastructure grant program. So this is a newer program and it was established by the legislature in 2021 with the purpose of increasing access and sales of motor fuels or gasoline containing at least 15% ethanol. And during the 2021 legislative session, a total of $6 million was appropriated to the department for fiscal year 22 and 23 for um, this grant program. And I just want to say that all motor fuels in, sold in Minnesota already have 10% ethanol in them. And E15 is gasoline that contains 15% ethanol, and that is also called unleaded 88. Um, two different names, same product. And E15 can be used in any vehicle that is 2001 or newer without any issues. And this program is really designed to help small businesses upgrade dispensers, underground storage tanks, hoses, and any other equipment that is needed to dispense that higher ethanol containing fuel. And this program supports the biofuel replacement goals under the Petroleum Replacement Promotion Statute. And also, the Governor's Council on Biofuels 2020 report recommended providing financial assistance to independent and small fuel retailers to upgrade their equipment so they can sell E15 fuels. Okay, so how this program works. MDA releases a request for proposals. 
um, seeking proposals from uh, gas stations for this grant program. And the proposals received are reviewed by MDA and an external panel um, that contain biofuels experts. These grants are awarded competitively and cover up to 65% of the eligible expenses. And in order to be eligible, eligible for this program, a, a gas station must be located in Minnesota and be independent or part of a chain that has 10 or fewer locations. So MDA released a request for proposals in early 2022, and we received an overwhelming response. We received 71 proposals, totaling more than $10.5 million in requests. And the six point five, or excuse me, the six million dollars for fiscal year 2022-23 that was appropriated by the legislature was matched uh, by a generous gift from the Minnesota Corn Growers Association of one million dollars. And the map on the right shows the distribution of the uh, the grantees, and this is also found in the legislative report if you want to look at a um, a bigger version of it. Overall, MDA awarded 44 grants totaling $6.48 million, and this leveraged $7.8 million in private investment. That includes both the corn growers' gift as well as the funds that were brought to the table um, by the applicants. Okay, so here's a summary of the grant recipients. Of the 14 awards made, 14 were made to women-owned businesses. Nine were made to black, indigenous, person of color owned businesses, and eight served tribal communities. And the grants ranged from 83,000 to 199,000, and the average was about $147,000. And on the right hand side of the slide, you'll see a picture of Nelson Auto World. This is our grantee spotlight. This fuel station is located in Minneapolis near the University of Minnesota campus, and they were the first gas station to fully impl implement their program, or to upgrade the infrastructure. And um, this is a family-owned business that was really excited to upgrade their pump so their customers could access E15 fuels. The biz business previously didn't have the proper infrastructure to um, dispense E15, but now, as you can see in the picture, there's four islands, and all four islands are dispensing um, E15. And the owner, Dan, says that E15 has been really popular with the customers and represents about one-third of the sales. Um, so the, the grants were awarded in fall of 2022, so not all of the projects uh, have been fully implemented. So the program impacts on this slide are um, more estimates of what we expect the, um, the grant program to accomplish. And this grant program expands market access to consumers by about 10%. The Minnesota Department of Commerce tracks how many fuel stations sell E15, and as of November 2022, there is about 462 gas stations that sold E15 out of a total of like 3,000 fuel stations throughout the state. And as a part of the program, we ask grantees to estimate what their increased fuel sales for E15 or E85 would be um, based on the grant, receiving the grant. And as you can see, there's an increase of about 23.5 million gallons of E15 estimated and about 2.5 million gallons of E85 estimated. And the last two points I want to make is that um, this program is really significant in that it saves consumers money at the pump. Um, over the past summer, when gas prices increased and prices were really volatile, E15 saved consumers dollars. Um, it's about five cents to 40 cents cheaper than regular unleaded 87 gasoline. And then lastly, um, increased use of E15 and other biofuels improves local air quality. Biofuels contain, like E15, contain fewer aromatic um, compounds and um, particulate emissions, so it improves local air quality when that is burned compared to regular gasoline. And that's all I have. Thank you for the opportunity to present on the programs. Thank you, Ms. Lennon and Deputy Commissioner Volba. Is it? Uh, are you guys going to stick around for a little while? 
I think it might be most efficient if we actually go into, now that we have a, a greater understanding of the issues here, we go into the, the bills themselves. So members, if we have questions for um, Deputy Commissioner Vaubo or Ms. Lennon, we'll ask them through the context of the bills that we're actually uh, addressing because they are much more concrete, more specific. So that brings us to our first bill uh, on the agenda today, Senate File 1178. Senator Hochschild, if you would please um, uh, approach the, uh, the table and begin to present your bill when you are ready. Thank you, Chair Putnam, members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to introduce Senate File 1178. Uh, as we just heard, the bioincentive program, which is administered by the Department of Agriculture, provides production incentives for innovative companies in Minnesota, Minnesota's biofuels and forestry industries. This bill seeks to provide full funding for this program to make good on the state's commitment to these projects. These companies have brought investments and jobs to Minnesota, and with this bill, I hope to see the state continue to invest in these programs. Through this program, companies may only receive payments after they invest in a project, create jobs, and begin producing eligible products. So the state is never at risk of paying for projects that fail to materialize. In addition, this bill would retroactively allow producers to apply for unpaid claims. The companies that participate in the bioincentive program are strong contributors to Minnesota's economy. The University of Minnesota found that in 2019, those companies employed 8,325 workers, generated $540 million in labor income, and generated $1.2 billion in overall economic activity through construction projects. And through ongoing operations, employed 2,415 workers, generated $127 million in labor income, and generated $610 million in overall economic activity. With that, I do have the A2 amendment, uh, Chair Putnam, if I can have that introduced. Senator Kupek moves the A2 amendment. Thank you. Senator uh, Hostel, to your amendment, please. This amendment would remove the statutory appropriation and replace it with a direct appropriation until 2027. In addition, it extends the eligibility for the incentive for producers that uh, apply by September 30th, 2023. Members, discussion of the A2 amendment. Members, any discussion or questions? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The A2 amendment is adopted. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, with that, I uh, will stand for questions, and I also do have testimony from Brendan Jordan as well. Mr. Jordan, if you would, please. Please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when ready. Uh, Chair Putnam and members of the committee, my name is Brendan Jordan. Uh, I'm with the Great Plains Institute and represent the Bioeconomy Coalition of Minnesota. Uh, we're pleased to support uh, Senator Hochschild's bill. Uh, the Bioeconomy Coalition of Minnesota brings everyone involved in the bioeconomy together to collaborate and grow the industry along the entire value chain from research and development to production and use. Coalition members include uh, uh, agriculture, forestry, biofuels sector, local government, non-governmental organizations, and startups. And we aim to, to uh, position Minnesota as a, as a leader in the bioeconomy. Uh, one, I want to add one additional factoid from the uh, University of Minnesota Extension study that Senator Hochschild quoted. Uh, for every dollar that, that uh, has been invested by the state of Minnesota, uh, the program has returned uh, $407 for Minnesota's economy and economic impact and $8.90 in new tax collections. This program has clearly been uh, a program that's offered a return on investment for the state. Um, and uh, we hope to see this program become fully funded and continue to, to meet its promise. Uh, I will just add that uh, this is a competitive time. This program was really intended to uh, help position Minnesota to attract new investments. I think it's done a great job at that. And that, that, invest, that competition is going to become more intense 
particularly with additional investment coming in from the uh, uh, IRA and IAJA federal legislation. So I think it's more important than ever that Minnesota fully fund programs like this that have been proven to attract new investment because it will just add additional federal investment and private investment. Uh, that concludes my remarks, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, we are pleased to support this bill. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Senator Hochschild, uh, we have uh, three more testifiers. Is that accurate? Yes. Uh, Mr. Radovich and Mr. Horton, if you would please uh, come to the table. Uh, Mr. Radovich, please state your full name when you get there and uh, commence your testimony. Chairman Putnam, members of the committee, my name is Tom Radovich. I'm the managing director of the Sappy Cloquet uh, operations in Cloquet, Minnesota. I, uh, I want to express my gratitude with the administration con continuing to provide funding for businesses who utilize sustainable bio-based raw materials and, and processes. The Bio-Incentive Fund does what its authors had attended, which is to drive innovation and investment in bioproducts and bio-based processes. In May of 2019, we invested $25 million in an expansion project to increase our verve dissolving pulp production by 8%, a product that was recently recognized by the Sustainable Apparel Coalition for world-class environmental stewardship. In fact, our verve dissolving pulp is one of the top 100 exported products by volume in the US, based on the Journal of Commerce. As a result of this investment, our recycled chemical use increased by a similar amount allowing us to utilize this fund for future investment. This mill has had to reinvent itself many times since 1898, when it was a groundwood newsprint mill. Our current product mix includes our verve dissolving, pulp for textiles, coated graphic papers for catalogs and advertisement materials, litho laminate papers for point of purchase displays, and the base paper for silicone release papers used in a multitude of industries for surface treatment. Our economic, economic impact in this region is significant. Our, our wood buy alone generates $4.6 billion in economic activity for the region based on a partnership study by the DNR and MFI. We spend $110 million in wood, of which 40 million is for loggers, 40 million to truckers, and 30 million to landowners. Our annual personnel cost is $80 million for 700 employees, of which 500 are union employees. Our capital costs typically provide a third of the investment to local contractors. For example, the project that we did in May of 2019 had an $8 million construction payroll. What I want this committee to hear is that the bio-incentive funding does influence our decisions for investment. In November 2019, we met with Governor Waltz and shared with him our future investment plans. While the pulp and paper industry continues to retract, our focus is on further diversification of wood-based products for long-term viability. Just this past October, we invested $11 million in our paper mill to allow us to move into uh, paper release products. SAPI is always looking for opportunities for future strategic investment to support our business for future generations. Our request is to increase the fund to meet the claims as it was intended. SF1178, introduced by Senator Hochschild, is, a, is an important first step. I would ask this committee to support the bill in its current form to show that Minnesota is committed to further investment in bioproducts and bio, bio waste processes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Radovich. Uh, Mr. Horton, if you would please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Mr. Chair and committee members, thank you for having me today. My name is Rick Horton. I'm the Executive Vice President of Minnesota Forest Industries. We're a trade organization representing the large wood consuming mills in the state, including SAPI, Fine Paper, and eight other member companies. Um, I'm here in support of Senate File 1178. As you've heard, the AGRI bioincentive program was created to entice businesses to invest in Minnesota and utilize biomass to generate electricity, heat, biochemicals, as well as biofuels. And doing so would reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, as well as creating products from what is generally considered waste. And we have an abundance of that waste material in the forestry world. Um, instead of the typical upfront subsidies that we often see with businesses, uh, this was a unique program to uh, create public benefits by requiring the companies to invest upfront and then be paid after the fact. 
and those subsidies are then based on production, actual production of the, of the product. Um, however, as you've heard, the, the program rapidly became underfunded, and the available funds were distributed in quarterly claims until the allocated funds were expended, and therefore no enrollees received all of the funds under their claims. And some fared a little worse than others due to the seasonality of their use of biomass. I'll give you an example of one of our member companies, Savannah Pallets, uh, which has facilities in McGregor and in Reamer, Minnesota. Um, they use biomass to heat their facilities instead of fossil fuels. And in the first quarter of the year, obviously you're, you're in the summer heading into fall, they don't burn any biomass. You get into the second quarter, and they start using some of the tail end of the second quarter, but by then the funds have been expended. So they've received very little of their claims due to the seasonality of the payments and the fact that those funds are limited. Um, so this bill would make all the program enrollees, including Savannah Pallets, whole for past claims. It also provides sufficient ongoing funds to attract more biomass-based industries to the state. As I've said, there's an abundance of uh, mill residues, there's an abundance of forest residues out there, you know, like hundreds of thousands of tons every year. Um, and we could be using those to help get us into the future in our bioeconomy. For those reasons, we encourage you to support SF 1178. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Horton. And I believe uh, Mr. Warner is here to, to testify as well, please. Mr. Warner, if you would please uh, take a seat, uh, state your full name for the record, and commence your testimony when you're ready. Chair Putnam, Vice Chair Kupek, Ranking Member Westrom, and members of the Senate Agriculture, Broadband, and Rural Development Committee. My name is Brian Werner, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Minnesota Biofuels Association, a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting and representing the renewable fuel industry in Minnesota. On behalf of the association and its eight ethanol production facilities, we appreciate the opportunity to provide testimony in support of Senate File 1178. I'd like to particularly thank Senator Hochschild for his leadership on this bill, as well as Senators Rarick, Frentz, Kupek, Kupek, and Dames for providing bipartisan support. The ethanol industry in Minnesota continues to substantially contribute to our economy. Last year, Minnesota ethanol production plants produced 1.34 billion gallons of ethanol, which according to University of Minnesota Extension, helped to generate $8 billion in economic activity through sales, including $1.9 billion in direct income for Minnesota residents. Across the state, the industry supports nearly 26,000 jobs. Minnesota ethanol plants have increasingly been making the capital investments necessary to develop and produce next-generation advanced biofuels made from cellulosic biomass. While most ethanol today is produced from the starch and sugars contained in corn, Several Minnesota biofuel producers have been able to bring to market advanced biofuel made from the non-edible fibrous material in each kernel of corn, sometimes referred to as corn kernel fiber ethanol. The Minnesota Department of Agriculture's Bioincentive Program was enacted to encourage the commercial scale production of these types of advanced biofuels, which have been shown to reduce life cycle greenhouse gas emissions by over 70% compared to gasoline. But in recent years, Claims have exceeded available funding, and many eligible production plants have been reimbursed for only a portion of their advanced biofuel production. The Minnesota Biofuels Association supports Senate File 1178 because it would provide sufficient funding to reimburse those facilities for their existing production gallons and put the state in a better position to spur additional investment in these low-carbon fuels. We've seen that the federal government, through the Inflation Reduction Act, has moved in a big way to incentivize the production of cleaner transportation and aviation fuels. Complementary state investment through legislation like this will ensure that Minnesota continues to harness the power of our state's rich agricultural, forestry, and energy resources to reduce transportation-related greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you again for the opportunity to, to testify today. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Warner, and also for uh, taking Senator Kupek and I on a tour in Winthrop. I would appreciate that as well. Yep. Thank you for coming. Yep. Um, members. Uh, members, uh, question, discussion of uh, Senate File 1178 as amended. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, Senator Hochschild, uh, we still... Uh, going with a $3 billion a year K-12 
cap for any recipient, or what what does your bill do for that? Senator Hostown. Thank you, Chair Putnam, Senator Westrom, for that question. Um, it is my understanding that we would uh, remove that cap to allow them to apply for the program as they need. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, Senator Hochschild, uh, how many entities uh, would go over that $3 million cap? Uh, and I know we had the gentleman from SAPI here. I think I know they're one of the larger users, but uh, do we anticipate more going over the $3 million cap? And uh, I guess a follow-up to that is how, how much of this new money would be uh, used for paying over or anticipated to be used to pay over the $3 million a year cap? Because we, we've had that in place for a long time. The, Senator Hustle, I'd also uh, point out that our, our friends from MDA here are to, uh, available to, to help as well with uh, some of the actual concrete details. Senator Hustle. Thank, thank you, Chair Putnam and Senator Westrom for those thoughtful questions. I am going to refer to the Department of Agriculture, perhaps, if they could provide any uh, guidance on the specific questions on how many qualify and, and what those look like. Mr. Chair, maybe that'd be great if we could get that answer. Thank you, Senator Westrom. Uh, Debbie Commissioner Vobel or Ms. Lemon? Lennon, excuse me, if you would please. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Representative for the or Senator for the question. Um, I think we st we have to get back to you on the the number that would go over the three million dollars, but I'll let I'll let uh, Ms. Lennon speak to that. Ms. Lennon. Yes. Mr. Chair, members, thank you for the question. Um, I don't have the information off the top, like ready to go, um, how many um, companies would go over the $3 million cap, but I am happy to crunch those numbers and get them back to the committee as soon as possible. Thank you, Ms. Lennon. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, that, that would be helpful if you could get that to the committee and myself. Uh, um, that That is a big departure from what this legislature has done for probably 30 plus years. Uh, that's kind of been a real benchmark of, of where the right match is. Uh, and so I guess, Mr. Chair, uh, while MDA folks are there, uh, have, I guess, can you comment and weigh in on that? Is that uh, something you're supporting at this time? Uh, has there been a time in history we've, we've uh, went over the cap uh, and then I guess maybe talk about that for a little bit for us, for our information. Ms. Lennon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. We have never gone over the cap when we are, have uh, reimbursed the claims um, since the beginning of the program. And I'm going to let uh, Deputy Commissioner Vobel take the first question that was asked. Deputy Commissioner Vobel. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom. Um, as Ms. Lennon said, uh, we've not gone over the $3 million cap. I, I don't know in the history of other programs what, what we've done, but in, in this one, um, we've held pretty close to that. I will also just mention a lot of, um, we don't actually get the, the, the actual, a lot of what it's, uh, we're, we're estimating what's going to be coming in by, by quarter. It's just what we generally hear from companies might be coming in, but we never quite know until the actual claims come in to us. Uh, for the, the total amount that will be paid out. Very Senator good. Westrom. Thank you. Um, and one, one final question. Uh, while, you, while you're there, uh, could MDA just w give us a picture of what, what we've seen in the last year or two years? Um, what What is the shortage been to, to in some quarters? Uh, the language we've had in the bill before was, was to intentionally prorate up front uh, so everybody knew that as they were going into the program. Uh, but can you just give us uh, a lay of the land and what, what, what you've seen maybe in the last one to two, three years um, and where are we at right now? How many, what, what percentage has gotten paid out each quarter? Ms. Lennon. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom. Um, in the in the legislative report on page nine, there is a table that shows the reimbursement, um, the, the amount claimed, the amount paid, and the amount unpaid. So that is like for your reference, if you want to look at that later. But I do have a table I can quickly summarize. Um, let's see, in fiscal year 22, um, there was about $7.8 million claimed, and that's a total for all the participants for all production types. 
there was uh, 4.4 million paid and 3.47 remained unpaid. And then for the, I'll just go backwards, um, for the last fiscal year that we have complete information for in fiscal year 2021, there are, the claims totaled 6.3 million, and I'm rounding to the first significant digit. Um, and the amount paid was 2.5 million, and 3.8 million remained unpaid. Senator Western. Mr. Chair, uh, th thank you for that. Can you, uh, wh what's the reason for the lower claimed number in the second year uh, than the first year, if, if you know? Ms. Lennon. Yes, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, um, there have been new facilities or program participants that have entered the program um, over the years, so that is one reason there um, would be more claimed. Um, I think that would be the, 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 the primary reason. Members, any further questions or discussion of Senate File 1178 as amended? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm looking at the bill and um, just wondering, you've moved the, with the amendment now, you've moved the date from June 30th of this year to September. Um, I guess, uh, will this prevent any new entities from being able to come forward uh, and uh, having production here in Minnesota? And I have a follow-up after that. Senator Hostel. Uh Chair Putnam, Senator Anderson, thank you for that question. So what our, what, what my author's amendment did was it moved the date for, uh, further. So it actually extended the amount of time that companies will have to apply and, and get in place for the program. So we just extended it three more months. I so understand. with that, with your thoughts in mind, to, to make more eligible if possible. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Hostel. So will, with this uh, date deadline there, will that help influence more people to come to, to Minnesota to establish, or will this uh, prevent uh, further uh, companies coming in? Um, Chair Senator Putnam, Stone. Senator Anderson, I, I can only, I don't know for sure what companies might be looking at coming. Uh, what I can say is that providing a, a, a longer date for applying for the program uh, would, in theory, encourage more uh, companies to get involved in the program, but, which was ultimately my goal, was to open up the, the excuse me, the deadline so that, so that more may possibly apply. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chair. Um, in look, <laughs> looking at the bill, it shows that uh, you have a, under appropriations unpaid claims that the cutoff is for June 30th, 2023 also. Uh, was that a mistake or as far as moving that date to September or was that the way you wanted to keep it that way? You, you moved June to September but now you have June 30th as a deadline for unpaid claims. Senator Hostel. Um, Chair Putnam, Senator Anderson, I, I believe what you're asking is the amendment may have changed the uh, the retroactive payments forward to June 30th. It was that, and that may not have been intended. Was that your? I guess I'm trying to. I didn't understand your question. If you would mind, Mr. Anderson, Chair. the headline on it is appropriation unpaid claims, and it, your. Date is no later than June 30th, 2023. Should that be September, as you've moved it already in your amendment, should that have been September 30th, 2023, instead of leaving it at June? Senator House, I think that we can ask uh, Ms. Painter uh, as our uh, legislative analyst to perhaps put in some uh, sort of clarification on this issue, if that's acceptable to you, Senator Hotshaw? Uh, Chair Putnam, yes. Ms. Painter? Thank you. So that appropriation is for um, retroactive claims, and then starting J July 1st of 2023 would be the, the new claims for the next, the next fiscal year. So June to September of 2023 is in the 2024 fiscal year. So what's in the bill is correct, I think. Thank you. 
Uh, last question I have is regarding the repealer. Uh, you have in their sections, uh, Minnesota statutes 41A 6.16, 41A.17, 41A.18, but yet you're repealing all of them uh, in your section nine. I'm wondering, can you give me an idea what those sections of statute uh, re reveal? Senator Hostow. Chair Putnam, I'm just, uh, and Senator Anderson, thank you for the question. I'm just trying to keep up with your question, and I do appreciate it. Mr. Chair, maybe the maybe a council can help yeah, us with that. I, that. Thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Painter, do you have insights you can share with us, please? So the the subdivisions that are being repealed um, were applied to facilities that um, were operational from April 1st until June 30th, 2025. So on um, the way the 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 1178 reads that with the amendment, a facility would need to be operational before September 30th, 2023, in order to receive incentive payments. Thank you, Ms. Painter. Senator Anderson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Ms. Painter, oh, what, what does the 41A, 16, 17, and 18 specifically say right now? Ms. Painter. Senator Anderson, on the last page of the bill that is in your folder is the sections, there's an appendix to the bill with the sections that are being repealed, if you want to look at that, but uh, 41A16 is the Advanced Biofuel Production Incentive, Subdivision 7, eligibility for participants after April 1st, 2023. 41A17 is a Renewable Chemical Production Incentive, eligibility for participants after April 1st, 2023. And 41A18, Biomass Thermal Production Incentive, is subdivision six eligibility for participants after April 1st. So Mr. Chair, Ms. Pater, they're being reintroduced into the new amendment that was put on the bill, even though they're repealed in the original bill, they're being brought back into the, uh, through the uh, amendment that we have before us, the A2 amendment, is that correct? Ms. Pater. I, that's why I don't understand why. Not, not exactly, um, Mr. Chair and Senator Anderson. So the, the the bill, sorry, the amendment ends the um, eligibility until September 30th of 2023 from what is in statute now is um, April 1st, 2023. So that extends that. I'll just add that these subdivisions were added last year in the agriculture omnibus bill. And so they weren't part of the, they were, they're a recent addition to the statutes. But they are going away. Ms. Painter? Yes, these are being repealed. And yet the, re the A2 amendment is bringing them back in as being recognized. Senator Anderson, with different dates, though, correct, Ms. Painter? Or? Yeah, I'm the A2 amendment. I, 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 yeah. It references the 41, 6, 41A16, 41A17, and 41A18 as being brought back in, even though you're repealing them in the original bill. Ms. Painter? Senator Anderson, it's, 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 it's subdivision seven of that section that is being repealed. It is not subdivision one, which is being amended in the bill. Perhaps that's the source of confusion. It's, it's individual subdivisions that are being repealed that are not being amended in the rest of the bill. Okay. Different subdivisions that are being amended. So 41A, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 41A, 16, 17, and 18 will come back in this whole, excluding those subdivisions that were repealed in the repealer, correct? Those- Ms. Painter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Anderson. Those sections are being amended, um, and those particular subdivisions are being repealed. Correct. Senator Anderson. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other further discussion of Senate File 1178 as amended? Senator Hostad, if you would, your final comments. Thank you, Chair Putnam, members of the committee. 
I'm, you know, I'm excited about this program, as we've seen and, and talked about a lot here today. This program has really grown uh, beyond the original intent of the program, and by that I mean in a good way. Um, and so we know in northern Minnesota we have a lot of um, industry members, a lot of logging and timber that, uh, that are reliant on, on this program and on these programs. And so I appreciate uh, and, and I'm hopeful for your support for us to make sure that we get whole on this program. We provide the back payments to those that uh, were reliant on this program and then move forward with, with something that's sustainable long term. Um, with that, I appreciate your, your time. Thank you, Senator Hostile. Senate File 1178 is amended. will be laid over for possible conclusion. conclusion. Uh, our next order of business is Senate File 1246. Senator Kupek, if you would, please. Uh, Take your space at the table. Senator Kupek to Senate File 1246, when you are ready. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I want to start. Uh, I do have the A1 amendment that I'd like to move forward. Uh, the original bill left open kind of the dollar amount at the beginning, and so then the A1 amendment just fills in that dollar amount. Senator Gustafson moves the A1 amendment to your amendment, Ms. Senator Kupek. Thanks. Members, any discussion or commentary about the A1 amendment? Senator Western. Mr. Chair, just, just give us a brief recap oh. of what, what it's for or why, why we're doing the A1. Sure. The, Senator Kupek. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The original bill was we left that amount blank. I think we were still kind of in discussion as to how much we wanted to appropriate out of the agriculture bill. Uh, we wanted to see what the governor also proposed. Uh, and then we kind of came back with the $6 million, which is basically uh, the same appropriation that this bill has had in the past. Thank you, Senator Kubik. Senator Weston. Members, any discussion or questions of the A1 amendment? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The A1 amendment is adopted. Senator Kupek, to your bill, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, Minnesota's always been a leader when it comes to biofuels. We're one of the first states in the country that started blending 10% ethanol into our fuels, and today nearly every gallon in the United States also contains 10% ethanol. Uh, E15, or E88, depending on how you want to call it, uh, contains 15% ethanol. It's often marketed uh, that way as 88. In 2012, the EPA approved the use of E15 in all vehicles 2001 or newer. We have a really great story to tell here about the biofuels industry in Minnesota. Uh, in 2013, the first station in the states to start it offered uh, E15. We sold 42,000 gallons. In 2022, the reported sales were over 100 million gallons, with an estimated sales much higher than that. Uh, with elevated fuel prices, consumers are continually turning to uh, E88, a cheaper price that has been averaging 17 cents uh, less a gallon uh, than regular 87. I personally, I drive the second furthest distance uh, from the Senate to my house. Only Senator Johnson has me beat. I have 242 miles one way. Uh, and I'm a familiar driver of Interstate 94 between Moorhead and the Capitol. Uh, as has traditionally been, uh, Alexandria, Minnesota has always been my stop off point uh, on the way down. This fall, for some reason, I had one day I was driving down to the Capitol and I don't know, I just felt the urge to go a little bit further than Alexandria, no offense to Senator Westrom, uh, but I continued on and I made my way to Melrose, Minnesota. And I thought, well, now's the time I will get off. Still my district, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Oh, okay, good. That's, I wasn't sure how far we went. That's excellent. So I got off in Melrose, and um, at much to my surprise, there's a Casey's uh, convenience store there, and much to my surprise, at that time, I believe the E88 uh, was about almost 40 cents a gallon less. Uh, so I fueled up my little car there, uh, and it's, now it's really good because now I can come to the Capitol and I can make it back to Melrose. So now Melrose has become my, 
my wonderful stop over place. So I have discovered that uh, much cheaper gas there. Uh, the one thing, of course, that's a Casey's convenience store. They are a very large chain. Uh, it's a new store, so they were able to put that in. Uh, the problem is there are some barriers to putting E88 in, and some of it is those blends and those tanks uh, cannot accommodate that. So what this bill will do is provide uh, money, grants out, uh, up to 65% so that some of these other stations, smaller chains, mom and pop stores, as we saw uh, earlier, can provide that. So the Biofuels Financial Assistance Program uh, was, just, uh, was started back in 2021 to focus on those smaller retailers and help them with some of the financial burdens it costs. And it's particularly good out in greater Minnesota where a lot of these smaller mom and pop stores are located. Uh, that money was appropriated and it was awarded to 44 fueling stations across the state. If you remember, we had a great presentation about this earlier. And we've continued to lead the nation in the number of locations with E15. We've now got 425 stations, uh, but there's still plenty of room to grow because there are 25 hundred of uh, fueling stations statewide so we can do that so sf 1246 will continue to expand this access to biofuels with over 10 percent across the state allowing those consumers to choose a fuel that is not only cleaner burning higher octane uh, but saves you a little bit uh, in the wallet so mr chair i have a few people who would like to testify as well thank you senator kubek uh, mr warner if you would please uh, state your full name for the record again and commence your testimony when you're ready Chair Putnam, Vice Chair Kupek, uh, Ranking Member Western, members of the Agriculture, Broadband, and Rural Development Committee. Again, I am Brian Werner, Executive Director of the Minnesota Biofuels Association. Um, we'd like to thank Senator Kupek for his leadership on this bill and for his faithful, uh, being a faithful consumer of the product. Um, so, um, one of the main legislative goals of the Minnesota Biofuels Association is to increase the availability of higher blends of ethanol, which have the benefit of driving commodity demand for farmers, lowering consumer energy costs at the pump, providing economic development in greater Minnesota, and improving air quality through decreased greenhouse gas emissions. In the last several years, we've seen that consumers increasingly purchase higher blends of biofuels when they're more widely available in the marketplace. Through December, though December sales have yet to be reported, through November of 2022, uh, Minnesota sold a record of 95.8 million gallons of E15 in Minnesota, which is commonly marketed as unleaded 88 at the pump. So those gallons not only extend our fuel supply at a critical time, but lowered the price of fuel for consumers. Uh, data from the Minnesota Department of Commerce showed that E15 was priced 25 cents per gallon lower than regular gasoline on average from June to August of 2022, which equated to $7 million in consumer savings in Minnesota in just those three months. So these savings have been able to reach more consumers thanks to the Biofuels Infrastructure Program, which provides grant funding to fueling stations uh, for blender pumps and underground storage tank installation um, for e that can accommodate E15 as well as other higher blends. Because of proactive investments by the Minnesota legislature through this program, we now lead the nation in offering E15 at more stations than any other state in the country, which directly contributes to our highest in the nation ethanol blend rate of 12.58% last year. So in continued investment in this program will drive these numbers higher and ensure that this cleaner burning, lower cost fuel reaches more consumers. So we strongly support Senate file 1246 and all other biofuel infrastructure investment proposals like the Liquid Fuel Modernization Act, because they will help us reach statewide E15 retail compatibility and lead to immediate and affordable emissions reductions via the, low the use of low carbon ethanol in our transportation fuel supply. Um, so thank you again for the opportunity to testify and um, we look forward to working with you to continue supporting the agricultural economy, diversifying our fuels, driving down gas prices and strengthening our national security. Thank you, Mr. Warner. Our, our next testifier is online. Mr. Severson, if you would please introduce yourself, your full name for the record and uh, unmute and commence your testimony when you're ready, please. Well, uh, thank you, Chair Putman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Richard Severson. I currently serve as the president of the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. Uh, I farm together with my wife and son in Clontarf, Minnesota. We raise corn, uh, soybeans, hay, and we have a small family uh, sheep operation. Key part of our farm operation is our membership in the Chippewa Valley Ethanol Company uh, a cooperative owned by 950 investor member owners who deliver their corn to the plant 
and we produce ethanol for fuel as well as industrial and beverage alcohols for specialty markets. On behalf of Minnesota corn growers, nearly 7,000 family farm members, I want to thank Senator Kupek for bringing SF 1246 forward, as well as his bipartisan list of co-sponsors. A key priority of the Minnesota corn growers is to expand access and use of higher ethanol blends like Unleaded 88, which is a fuel blend containing 15% ethanol. Unleaded, Unleaded 88 helps to improve air quality and reduce carbon emissions while giving drivers a higher octane fuel at a lower price. The corn raised on family farms like mine not only produces ethanol from the starch of the kernel, but also high value protein rich dried distiller's grain as a source of livestock feed, as well as crude corn oil, which can be used to make biodiesel fuel for diesel engines. Co-product utilization at Minnesota's 19 ethanol plants has resulted in greater efficiency. And as a result, today's corn ethanol reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 46% on average compared to gasoline. Not only does blending ethanol with gasoline result in lower carbon emissions, but it also causes reductions in particulate matter, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen, nitrogen oxides, which can create smog. The carbon emission reduction profile of today's corn ethanol has been verified by the U.S. Department of Energy and Agriculture, the California Air Resources Board, and academic institutions ranging from the University of Illinois to Harvard, MIT, and UC Davis. The ethanol industry is not only crucial to corn farmers' economic vitality, but higher blends of ethanol and fuel also provide multiple benefits to Minnesota consumers, communities, and the economy. Ethanol was first blended in our fuel to help fight air pollution and smog, and a key reason why Minnesota started using ethanol blends in the metropolitan area way back in 1992. Ethanol is a key component in our fuel supply that not only acts as an octane booster, but also displaces harmful aromatic hydrocarbons. In 2021, the Hormel Institute released a study focused on the reduction of these harmful aromatics and the potential cancer risks that they cause. Research on these harmful aromatics is still ongoing. One of the key challenges in moving to a 15% blend of ethanol statewide is updating the sometimes costly equipment upgrade, upgrades at retail locations. MCGA supports finding a long-term, ongoing funding source to assist retailers with those upgrades and replacements of infrastructure needed to offer high blends of biofuels statewide. SF-1246 is a major step in the right direction to begin expanding access to higher blends of ethanol in Minnesota. E15 and other higher level blends not only will benefit Minnesota corn farmers, but people from across the state with the benefits of a cheaper option that provides higher octane and air quality without sacrificing vehicle efficiency. I'd like to thank you, Chair Putman, for the opportunity to testify today, especially uh, making the remote option available to me on SF-1246. And we look forward to continue working with you, Senator Kupik, and the rest of this committee on ways that we can expand biofuel use in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Severson. Uh, members, questions, discussion of Senate File 1246 is amended. Senator Westrom. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just got to say hi to uh, my constituent, uh, Mr. Severson, also from Senate District 12, but far from Melrose over in Swift County. So <laughs> anyways, uh, Chair, uh, Senator you, Kupik. No, oh, thank you. Um, Senator Kupik. You uh, mentioned the, the Melrose uh, location, so that, that's interesting. I have never quite found it 40 cents cheaper, but that's a good good find. I'll um, have to uh, spread the word uh, as well. But um, just a little fun story about Melrose being part of the district and uh, the biofuels and the innovations that we see across our area. But to the north of the freeway, uh, there used to be a full service station that was uh, selling E85 and uh, other stations of uh, gas there. But uh, uh, so they've got a nice little hub of, of options there. They actually have a propane uh, location at the same uh, station to the north um, that sells propane for vehicles that have been converted to propane. So they're quite innovative there. But uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure if you're old enough to know what full service is, uh, but uh, <laughs> I, I had fun with a young young uh, intern once when we were coming to the cities and she was riding down with us. 
And uh, my wife and I liked to stop there because they had full service in the winter. And she said, what, what is full service? And so uh, that's a, a, sign of, sign of, a sign of the times. But um, for anybody that doesn't know, they actually pump your gas for you under full <laughs> service. And so uh, that has gone by the wayside. But uh, um, maybe we can get back to it with that kind of savings. Uh, Senator Kupik, uh, they can probably uh, give a full service option. But uh, thanks, thanks for bringing this forward. I do have a serious question, just somewhat serious. Um, uh, notice you're changing the account from the bio infrastructure account to the biofuels um, fund. What's what's the reason for that? And are we going to have two separate accounts now, one in Agri, one outside of Agri, or what? What's the reason for the change? And is it going to kind of bring confusion? Why not just continuity of the same program that people are getting to know? I think that, uh, thank you for the question, Senator Westrom. I think that Deputy Commissioner Vobble is about to field that one for you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom. Um, we actually, you bring up a good point. I think we would prefer to see it within Agri. I think that was, uh, I think um, supporters of, the, of this would, would be okay with that. Um, to your point, it's a, it's a great spot within Agri as it is, uh, Agri is for, um, renewable energy and, and innovation and, and research and those types of things. So we think it's a, a great spot um, to add on to the existing appropriation there. So um, you, you bring up a good spot at a point, and I, I think um, supporters would agree. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deputy Commissioner and Mr. Chair. So Senator Westrom, to my potential youth uh, relative to you, um, I heard a rumor that you're having a fairly significant birthday this year. Uh, and if we actually find out the date, you will be cupcaked. <laughs> Uh, and, and on that front, you will become my age. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chair, thanks for the warning, and uh, you wouldn't be the first guy I've alluded. <laughs> Senator Dames has a question. No, Senator so, Mr. 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 Chair, I do have one more follow-up. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sure, Senator Westrom. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, and, and Senator Kupik, but maybe uh, Deputy Commissioner, uh, j just something for discussion. I assume we're laying, li laying this bill over for possible inclusion. Um, Deputy Commissioner, maybe I'll start with you. One of the concerns we've had over the years is this is a good way to invest in the necessary or needed infrastructure. And there's some stations that just have older equipment or ready to get updated. Others, not as old, but they need it updated to be able to sell and let it 88. Um, what has been your experience of the grant requests on equipment that we're replacing? Do we generally find it being pretty old and likely would be at or near the end of its life? And where I'm going with my question to, to bring the full circle is, do we need possible guardrails on this program to make sure we are targeting equipment that is likely not to pass a future EPA change in standard or UL certification? And um, I can go into it a little bit more, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, the whole idea is we don't want to replace fairly good equipment that's got a lot of life left in it, likely. It's the, the U.S., uh, the EPA regulation. We really need federal action on, on just making that regulatory change, approving unleaded or uh, ethanol t E10 uh, equipment to E15. In most cases, that should work. But until we get that, a lot of stations are hamstrung, and uh, but are, are we are we getting older equipment, or are you finding fairly recent equipment that's just not certified getting tore out and putting in new stuff? Um, and maybe a follow up if you can want to just answer that, Commissioner Volvo. Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, um, yes, thank you for the question. We have lots of thoughts about what the federal government could do uh, related to E15, uh, but that can be for a whole other hearing. Um, uh, I, I will say that what's nice about the, the program as it's written is it, it really is targeted towards those smaller sort of mom and pop shops with, with less than 10. So we do tend to find that it is the older equipment that they have to, that have, that have reached its, its its useful life and, and need uh, upgrading. Um, so, so I would say the, the, the trend is usually more of the older equipment that we're replacing as opposed to somewhat newer equipment that, that we're trying to bring into compliance. Follow up, Senator Westrom? Yeah, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator, or, or Senator Kupik, uh, but Deputy Commissioner, uh, 
I, I just just food for thought I, as we consider this as it moves forward or into an omnibus bill, whether whether we should have language um, that just guides the that the, the, the preference should go to older equipment not likely to meet a UL certification if if the EPA were to update their regulations. And I guess that I, I understand that's a bit nebulous and a little uncertain, but I think you get my point, and it's just food for thought. Uh, Senator Kupik, if you have any thoughts on it, and I'm not looking for a precise, exact answer either, but just something maybe we could work on if, if the need arises. Senator Kupik. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Senator Putnam, and thank you, Senator Westrom. Yeah, I think that's a, I would be open, very open to doing that. I think that's a, a good guardrail, and I think we'd want to, that would be a much wiser use of the funds to go and eliminate that older equipment, especially those would be more likely to have a problem. So I, I would consider adding that certainly to this bill. Thank you, Senator Kubek. Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Senator Kupek, could you tell me how many retailers, retail stations there are in Minnesota? Do you have any number on that? I believe the number here that I have is uh, 2,500 fueling stations. And that would be all. Senator Dames. The, Mr. Chair, Sorry. thank you. And that would be all the stations. That, that is Kupek. the number that I have been given, yes, Senator. And so as I understand, you have a... Uh, up to 65% participation with a max of 200,000 per station. <laughs> Senator Kupet. Right. And so it is uh, last, Senator, uh, the last time we did this, uh, there were 44 stations that qualified for this. Yep. And then they, the amount of money was 65%, and then the stations would have to kick in a 35%. Senator I, Dames. I, I guess my concern, Mr. Chair, I guess my, one of my concerns is is we're looking at a process of over 10 years to get this done or more. Uh, have you thought at all about uh, taking a look at changing the amount of money you're putting into this program? Senator Kupek? Chair Putnam, Senator Dames. Uh, yeah, I think that um, if, if the ag budget would, would suffice, I think we'd all like to see a lot more money go into this program. So. Um, Maybe um, certainly Chair Putnam, when we get down to that discussion of what exactly we have left to allocate, I, th I think this is a great program. I would love to see more funding for it. I think, I think this is, we felt like this is where we have been at. This is more uh, currently than the governor is asking for his budget, which is just 4.5 million. Uh, so we, we thought this was a good number, but I'm certainly open to, and I, I think all my supporters would certainly be open to increasing the funding for this as well. Senator Dames. So, any idea how much you think you could get additional money you could get for this program? <laughs> Senator Quebec? Uh, I, I don't know. That. Some of that I think will be up to, to Chair Putnam and, and how much the uh, ag budget uh, totals out for. So, unfortunately, Senator Dames, I'm going to have to get it back to you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of figured that would be the case, and I understand. Yep. Well, thank you, Senator Kupek, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further questions or discussions? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, reading some of these uh, testimonial or people that have written in here um, and looking at the bioproduct facilities that are being looked at for the bioincentive program, <clears throat> it talks about uh, this, this one uh, uh, public policy transportation and fuels Great Plains Institute. Uh, Asked for written testimony, thanks us for written testimony on Senate file 1788. I think that's a mistake. But um, in the bottom of it, it says, Thank you for your consideration for this important legislation and for the opportunity to submit written testimony and to fully fund the program for future pro existing, for future and existing projects to drive us further with the investment into the future. Having in the Senate and the House passing the blackout bill already, how many years will it take before these will these existing facilities no longer be uh, available for this program? Senator Anderson, I, I believe that's a, a letter of support for the bill that we have completed already for Senate File 1178. We're on uh, Senate File 1246 now. Well, it talks about a bio incentive program. We're on the biofuel financial assistance appropriation at this point. Okay, but the question still remains. 
how long will these facilities that burn, that basically have wood uh, and energy here from wood, uh, old hulls and things like that, how long will they exist uh, having passed the, the uh, blackout bill in the Senate and the House? Well, Senator Anderson, again, that's a, a question uh, most appropriate for the bill that we discussed earlier. I think Senator Hostile would love to discuss that with you, but the bill that's before us currently is about biofuels specifically. We're talking about ethanol plants, ethanol and uh, gas programs. So that is a, 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 a perhaps an excellent question, but one most uh, best uh, uh, asked of Senator Hostile. Members, any further discussion or commentary on Senate File 1246 as amended? Seeing none, Senate File 1246 as amended. Oh, sorry, Senator Kupak, final comments. Uh, I would just first of all just want to want to thank the uh, co co authors on the bill, Senator Westrom, Senator Gustafson, Senator Dornick, and Senator Putnam too for going along with us. And I am uh, very excited about the biofuels. Uh, industry going forward. I think there's a lot of really good things uh, coming our way on this, so I'm, I'm happy to, to bring this bill forward. Thank you, Senator Kubik. Uh, Senate File 1246 as amended will be laid over for possible inclusion. So, members, uh, what's coming up next is uh, Wednesday. Wednesday, we're going to get to hear from our friends at the Minnesota Milk Producers. Uh, it's their dairy day at the Capitol, and we're going to get to watch their Producer of the Year video. Then we've got a whole bunch more of Senator Rob Kupek. Uh, who will uh, hopefully bring the same level of enthusiasm and joy that he did uh, to his presentation today. But anyone in the audience, if, if you were enthralled by Senator Kubak's discussion of biofuels, wait till you see him talk about county agriculture inspector grants, uh, which is something he'll be talking about on Wednesday. In addition, we'll be hearing Senate File 1115, also from Senator Kubak, funding increases for county and district agricultural society premium aids. Then Senate File 1230, also Senator Kupek, International Marketing Opportunities, Appropriation for Farmers. And then the last bill we were here that day will be uh, Senator Frentz, who will be here to share with us a discussion of Senate File 1088, Agriculture-Related Business Assistance Appropriations. So that's uh, what's coming at us next. Uh, there being no further business before the committee. Question, uh, questions, um, Chair, Mr. Chair. Um, seeing as it's milk day, will we get some kind of milk product to sample? Do we know? Uh, Senator Kunish, I think there's a pretty good chance. I, I realize that that's why we're all on this committee, is for the treats. It's winter, uh, it's cold, we could use some ice cream, I'm just saying. <laughs> I like chocolate milk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Senator Kunish, the, the order will be Chair. placed. Uh, <laughs> Senator Westrom? Mr. Chair, I... I um, I think that's the chair and maybe delegated to the CA's job to uh, <laughs> pass that on sometimes. Oh, well, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Dames, we we're taking what, orders apparently, Senator what Dames. What you could probably do here is instead of having the committee here and here, have it over at the Cali, old Cali Inn, because that's where they're going to have the reception during our meeting. We are full of good ideas here today, you guys. Uh oh. All, a bipartisan plan uh, for treats. Uh, I'll, I'll put in a good word for ice cream uh, and uh, take orders. Uh, so uh, thanks, folks. There being no further business before the committee, we are adjourned. <laughs>